You're listening to The Big Lift, the podcast of Web Trends Optimize, the CRO solution that enables marketers and developers to maximize the ROI on their digital properties. Web Trends Optimize is a powerful, feature rich, and easy to use solution, all delivered within a fixed price contract with no additional cost for increased functionality ever. During these podcasts, we meet some of the key influencers within the marketing and conversion world to understand their roles and examine their challenges. In today's podcast, I talk with Shiva Manjanath, Experimentation Manager at Solo Brands. Solo Brands is a US-based lifestyle e-commerce conglomerate that sells its products direct and through marketplaces. We all know that experimentation is about testing to learn as opposed to testing to win, but that isn't always true especially during the early adoption phase. Shiva and I discuss why learning to test is as important to testing to learn and it should be an ongoing facet of good experimentation. Shiva, uh, during our early discussions, you came across as very passionate about CRO and testing. What is it that excites you so much about it? It's, I guess it's just like the mystery of it. Like it's fascinating to just like run a test and then see what happens. You're testing with a bunch of live people and you just never know what happens. And perhaps there's a little bit of the dopamine hit of like <laughs> hitting a test winner or having your assumptions being validated. But I mean, it's it, there's a lot of like great unknown with testing and we do our best to mitigate the risk and try and get closer to an understanding with research and data and all this stuff. But at the end of the day, a test that you're running is based on not understanding or not having like, you know, 100% confidence that something will win or lose. So it's it's quite interesting. And I think it requires a bit of uh, humbleness to <laughs> run tests because if you're running tests and you're surprised and you're angry with test results, then that's probably not the field for you. But I don't know. I think all of us are genuinely just curious people who all just want to continue to learn as much as we can and, I don't know, man. I just find it incredibly fascinating. It's it's interesting that you use the words win or winning tests in that phrase. But surely, as as we both know, CRO is about testing to learn and not testing to win. But shouldn't we first concentrate on actually learning to test? Yeah, that's that's a very that's a very astute flip of the words there. I actually really like that because I do think that experimentation has to win. Ultimately, you do have to generate results. Um, I think Ronnie Kohavi wrote a post recently about this saying like, at the end of the day, if, if you're just presenting a bucket of insights without any tangible like revenue increase, then your program isn't a success and no one's going to really care. So at the end of the day, it is correct that you do have to ultimately win. But to me, test to learn is a process. And I think a lot of times people don't focus on the process, i.e. learning to test, which leads to garbage results or it leads to, um, you know, perhaps, you know, agencies or other people looking for reasons why something won rather than looking at the bigger picture and saying, well, no, 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 this is, this is what happened. Um, but I do think it's a pretty clever twist of the words that I might have to steal. <laughs> it's okay. I've copywritten it already. <laughs> <laughs> do you believe companies, um, especially in the early stages, are absolutely focused on testing to win? I don't think so. I, I think lower maturity uh, experimentation programs tend to try and go very, very fast and and there's a part of truth to that, or maybe a part of logicalness to that. I think a lot of times within the education around experimentation, people assume that as, as soon as you hire an experimentation person, you're paying for wins. Um, or you're paying for an experimentation person that can dev, design, you know, QA, analyze, strategize, and do all the things. And, you know, there's very few unicorns who could do all of those things well. So I think experimentation maturity is important when we think about process. And I think a lot of, you know, lower maturity programs tend to, you know, maybe look for shortcuts or try and get advice and, and look for perhaps the best way to achieve the results rather than the best way to run the process. And I keep on harping on this because I do think there is 
a lot of lack of education around specifically, like you're saying, the, the learn to test. People aren't really focusing on, you know, the process. They're so laser focused in on results that they lose sight of the hard work that's required to get to that point. Do you think people use best practice or, or search the Internet for best practice when they're first starting out in, in testing and then just blindly follow what they believe is best practice? Yeah, uh, I think what a lot of people genuinely believe, I think it's a misnomer because best practice implies you could do it with almost guaranteed results. And I don't necessarily, <laughs> uh, as we talked about last time, my, uh, my analogies come into play quite often. I don't necessarily blame the drug users as I do the drug dealers in the same way here. I don't necessarily blame the, the folks who see someone talking about a best practice and saying, oh, okay, great, I could just do this, rather than you know, taking a look at people who are saying these things and saying, you know, a lot of these quote unquote best practices lack so much context and they're just sold as something that uh, you could just do and have guaranteed results. So if you're new to the space and you see someone smart saying something that you seem as logical, then of course you'd believe it. But again, I think it's education. I think as much as we could do to educate on, you know, Everyone's looking for shortcuts, mm -hmm. and that's logical. But at the end of the day, if you're looking for shortcuts, you might as well go to like, you know, your local 7 Eleven and get the diet pills that aren't FDA approved and have no guarantees of results rather than, you know, the tried and true go to, you know, have a, have a workout that's tailored to you and your BMI. And if you're trying to lose weight or get your six pack abs, like I am right now, work in progress, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, you have to put in hard work. You can't just, you know, take a couple pills and, and, and have a six pack. But one of the challenges I think is there is this thing called YouTube and a lot of people learn off YouTube and there's no bit that says this is the best way that you can actually guarantee. It's not like you've got a rubber stamp that this person is the best person to be able to, to deal with best practice. It is, to a degree, I would suggest, a bit of flying by the seat of your pants and who do you learn from? Have you got any suggestions as to, as to how people can actually get their own best practice built? Yes, you should listen to me and only me because I'm the smartest <laughs> person in experimentation and you should follow no one else's advice. Somehow I um, knew you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but for real, I think the I think that people like we just kind of I keep on repeating myself here, but I think it's worth stapling home that people are so laser focused in on results that and, and like shortcuts that they don't take the time to focus on the why. I think this is tactically true within experiments that perhaps people are so laser focused in on winning that they're not taking the opportunity and time to learn. They're not taking the time to understand and test out the psychology and validate hypotheses and do research. They're just looking for the quick wins. They're just looking for results as soon as you possibly can. In the same way within experimentation programs and like looking for these best practices and even following people, take the time to understand why someone's advice or someone's call outs are like, why are they saying these things? What is the research behind what they're saying? What is the logic? Can you then take these concepts and then apply it to your own things? And, and I would say never just blindly accept something that anyone says, including myself. But take it as that's an interesting thought. I should perhaps try it, you know, test it on your own or perhaps, you know, reach out to me or even do your own investigation to try and understand why is it that this person is saying what, what they're saying? Because a lot of times there is a very clear why and make sure that that why applies to you. I think a lot of times we hear advice from folks um, such as people in like booking.com or Microsoft.com. And these folks have built some badass experimentation programs mm -hmm. and they know what they're doing when it comes to their audiences and they have a plethora of resources at their disposal to run some of the top tier experimentation programs. And they learn quite a bit along the way. But oftentimes what I do see is, you know, what is advice is not necessarily the best advice for you. And in the same way that, you know, 
I, I've seen kind of jumping around LinkedIn a couple times. That's, uh, you know, you have to have 125K sessions to run an experiment in each variation. Otherwise, you'll never reach that SIG or it's not going to be adequately powered. Mm -hmm. And that's based on an assumption that I think it's like 2% MDE, like detectable effect in your experiment. But if that test has a 10% lift to conversion rate, then you don't need 125K sessions and it will still be adequately powered. You'll need, you probably need a lot less than that. So, so that's where the advice can be, you know, 125K sessions is definitely a very nice luxury to have, but understanding the practicality and exactly where that 125 is coming from, which is a lower MDE can then allow you to take that, you know, general guidance, which makes sense. And then say, okay, but perhaps we could test bigger things that are core to the hypothesis and go for bigger swings that will have bigger MDEs. And then it'll still be adequately powered. And perhaps we might not win as much or we might not be able to detect smaller test things, uh, test changes. But it's still, you could still run a successful experimentation program. That being the case, I think there's a floor to that as well, that if you have like, you know, 200 sessions a month, experimentation is probably going to be extremely difficult for you in, in most capacity to which I'd say defer to other forms of research while you focus on getting more traffic to your site and, you know, building up your brand. Yeah, because just in, in what we've said in the last two or three minutes, there there is this ethos that you've got to have enough visitors to your site to run a successful test. And so that's immediately if you like, best practice, which is being called there. But you can see that there are some benefits in being able to run tests with smaller visitor numbers. But you've also got to be careful of the fact that they can be skewed quite easily because the numbers are so small. So somebody that's kind of relatively trying to find their way in learning about testing, it's pretty confusing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I don't envy it. I don't envy people who are new to the game to try and sift through all of the information and getting competing types of information along the way. I, I would just say this, like do your best to try and, you know, run adequately powered experiments and can, and you know, when I, even when I was running the experiments seven, eight years ago, they weren't great. They honestly weren't great. I didn't know what SRM was way back in the day um, or simple ratio, ratio mismatch. Um, I didn't know what that was. I just assumed you could divide percentages and it'd be good. And then, you know, papers are coming out like, no, no, no. If it's if you have SRM, you can basically invalidate your test results. I didn't know that was a thing. I just assumed we could divide the numbers and it wouldn't be a big deal. I'd say continue to try and do your best because even experimentation isn't foolproof. It's a very good tool to help mitigate risk and generate insights and identify learnings. But there's always probabilities and chances that you'll have false positives and false negatives. There's always a chance that your tool broke and you were never fully able to identify, you know, the bug in the experiment and it might have gone under the radar. You do your best to try and mitigate risk as much as you can. But at the end of the day, ex using experimentation to help guide in making data driven decisions is just far and away superior to just not doing that. So just going back to the, the early conversation we have about testing to win rather than testing to learn, do you think the word conversion in conversion rate optimization is setting a kind of a precedent to say actually conversion equals win equals revenue equals profit? It could be. It very well could be. It's interesting because I do think that CRO as a term has been a net positive to the industry, albeit recently probably more harmful than helpful because it was a very easy and sexy way to sell experimentation, which it's like, I don't, I don't need like, you know, Erlenmeyer flasks on my website. What the hell is this experimentation versus CRO sounds sexy and it sounds powerful and it sounds interesting. So it helped get buy-in for building out programs and conducting the experiments under this veil of CRO way back in the day it's the same way that like growth hacking I, I don't know if anyone could logically define or even define growth hacking because i'm sure it depends on the person but it just sounds sexy so i'm sure people love using that term even though it could just mean whatever you want it to mean technically experimentation is growth hacking i guess but in that same vein i think recently people one see that term and then think all it is is 
like improving conversion rate to which people would be like, that's cool, but I don't care about CRO or conversion rate. I care about AOV. So where's AOV? Oh, AOV optimization. Um, you know, I care about lifetime value. Where's LTV optimization? <laughs> so I think generally people might see that term and they'll say, eh, eh, maybe that's not for me. And then there are folks who try and capitalize on the increase in popularity with CRO and then basically boil it down to here's your list of best practices to optimize your conversion rate, i.e. CRO. Have a green button, have it be verb based, which isn't bad advice anyway, but <laughs> um, you know, have it right aligned and copy Amazon and do all these things and then they just label it CRO, which then ultimately gives experimentation people a bad rap because we're kind of lumped into the bucket of people just selling best practices and not actually selling out experimentation. So it's a long winded way of saying I, it's fine. It, like I don't love it. I, I appreciate that it helped in its growth, but if we could pivot away from CRO into just being more experimentation focused, I think that'll be a huge net win for the industry. Yeah, I think so too. But I do think that CRO is a, an entry point into experimentation, which is easier to sell to the business because they can actually see yep. an investment versus a return on investment. But as we both know, CRO isn't just about winning tests. It's about other things as well. It can be risk mitigation. What's your thoughts on that? If I had to pick a percent of how much experimentation is superiority testing, i.e. finding winners... Um, versus risk mitigation. I don't think any one company would fit in a specific realm of like, you could easily say it should only be 40, 60, 50, 50, 70, 30. I think it depends on the company. It depends on the program, depends on the strategy, depends on the goals of the the company where the experimentation sits. But to say that experimentation is only about finding winners and not about making sure that you don't prevent losers is... Like we should make sure that experimentation helps prevent risk and mitigate it as well. Um, when we say mitigate, it means rolling out something at a hundred percent without knowing it's a net loser versus testing it at fifty percent and identifying it as a loser are two ways that you're mitigating risk. Mm-hmm. Classic examples of like of redesigning home pages, redesigning sites. So many times I've dealt with clients and been in-house where we've redesigned a site and the testing complexity around redesigning the site was so difficult that we just never tested it. And this is way early on in my career when I didn't have as much leverage to be able to tell the CEO as a lowly analyst, hey, we shouldn't redesign the site. We should test it. Um, didn't have much pull back then. <laughs> but uh, when, when you're trying to do that, when we ran this with one company in particular, we rolled it out and we just like, it almost like site conversion rates flatlined. And it didn't flatline to zero, like something broke in the analytics, but it was damn near close to zero. And it was awful. And then we were looking at heat maps and session recordings and we were finding all of these choke points, all of these problems. And we, it, we ended up reverting back to the original version. But Here's where experimentation comes in with risk mitigation, because you could iterate along the way to know what's potentially working and not. What are choke points? You're not investing, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars on in, you know, on a redesign that then you have to go back from scratch and redo work. So that's cost savings. And assume that the results were just slightly negative. You may not even be able to attribute that to... Um, the redesign as a whole. But, you know, with experimentation, you're able to split traffic 50-50 and take things like seasonality generally out of the equation because you're splitting it 50-50. Pre and post, like, tests, quote-unquote tests, have a difficult time of capturing that type of data. So what, what if it's possible that there was just a natural increase to your site conversion rate with your audience but your redesign was actually like a minus, you know, 7%, but the traffic was naturally naturally increasing at like a plus 2%. So there was some risk mitigation in there that if you had done an A-B test in some capacity, you would have been able to identify that, well, it's actually the redesign that's a problem 
in a much major way than we anticipated. Versus if you just look at top line results, you'd say, eh, it's not the end of the world. So I just went pretty deep into risk mitigation and it, it's, I, we can keep on going down this route, <laughs> but it's just so powerful. It's such a powerful tool that so many times it just boggles my mind that people um, either ignorantly or purposefully choose not to utilize experimentation as a data-driven way to you know, validate decision-making and move the business forward. So I've been flicking through your LinkedIn and I, I do like the fact that you are educating people in our field with utilizing, I suppose, humorous kind of ways of being able to get people involved in that thought process. And I, and I really like the one about correlation isn't causation. Perhaps you might just want to talk about the ice cream sales versus shark attack, because I think that's a that's a poignant discussion point where people should actually listen and say, oh, yeah, am I making a hypothesis which is sound or not sound? I think Matt Bischel wrote something and put a link in that comment about a bunch of different correlations that aren't causations and a bunch of different charts. That's pretty funny to just take a look at it. But effectively, the the chart was another example of highlighting correlation versus causation. And what it showed was a chart that saw an increase and a decrease of like shark attacks. And then layered right behind that line following the same basic trend was ice cream sales. And if you were to take a look at that without any historical context of it and you just saw the data, you'd say, interesting, the, whatever these two trends are that we're putting on this chart there's probably something related to both of these that could even be causational because it seems like when one goes up the other one goes up and when one goes down the other one goes down so if you were to logically think about this and say there's causation here you'd say an increase in ice cream sales leads to more shark attacks therefore we should ban ice cream sales because Sharks are attacking kids as we sell more ice cream or whatever. Yeah. Uh, obviously, there's some uh, that breaks logic very quickly because that's just not based in fact. That's a correlation where um, the intermediary connecting the two is an increase in ice cream sales means it's hotter outside. When it's hotter outside, that means more kids or people are in the water. And then as a result, when there are more people in the water, there's more people for sharks to then attack. And then, as a result, likely more shark attacks. Um, however, I am curious about that, too, because how many of these, like, what is the sample size of the sharks being attacked? <laughs> um, and my experimentation hat just went on that, and I probably should have went deeper and geekier in that, as you can tell how my brain works. Uh, I digress. I think it's an interesting <laughs> read anyway. But, uh, you know, to my point, I think it, it's taken on the the idea of being able to learn to test. I think it's important that we in the industry continue to offer snippets. I won't say best practice, but snippets, ideas, thought processes that, that work for us and maybe might work for somebody else and to, to guide people. Because I think one of the challenges is that there just isn't enough education around at the moment with regard to experimentation, testing, um, CRO, whatever you like to call it. And I think as an industry, we need to probably help a little bit more. Yeah. Just moving on a little bit, do you believe that in the whole kind of CRO experimentation, there's some maturity model or something like that, or how to move from the testing to win to testing to learn? Because I think there's a lot of people that get hung up, certainly in the early stages, about winning, and then that becomes the de facto standard that they're always trying to win. Is there something that we can we can help with people to be able to move away from that? Yeah, I would say, I mean, it can be difficult because in the industry, especially with a lot of jobs and clients I've consulted with, they are hiring a CRO person to win. So when they are hiring someone to win and you run three tests and you say, look at what we've learned, this is interesting. There are many leaders who will then say, I, I could care less about anything that you've learned. Why haven't these tests been winning? I hired you to make me money. Why are these tests not winning? Um, there was one client I worked with back in the day that um, we ran one test with them and they almost canceled our contract because they're like, why didn't it win? Why aren't you running tests that are going to win? 
which is a pretty interesting peek into the mind of people who don't understand experimentation that um, we just we, we don't know that tests will win or lose. That's why it's a test. It seems like such an easy thing to vocalize for myself out loud. Mm-hmm. But the fact that there are so many people that don't understand that to be true is a testament to the lack of education just around experimentation in our industry. So yeah, I think what we can do is sometimes you're up against the wall that there are certain leaders who just will not understand experimentation and will never see it as a value because all they see it as is a tool to print money. I think as best as we could do to educate around the process around things like these insights are teaching us how to move towards these tests. And as quickly as you can hit a test win based on these insight-driven tests, great. I think that's the absolute best thing to do, but you should be doing that regardless, I guess. Mm -hmm. But do your best to educate that the insights aren't necessarily worthwhile on their own, but they're helping us go back to our prioritization framework, back to our process, and saying, these are the tests that we don't want to prioritize any longer. And instead, these are the new tests that we want to prioritize. And even education and saying, this is what we're following. We conducted some research. We have a problem statement. We hypothesize on this is how we could solve for this problem to increase conversion rate, revenue, whatever the metric that we're trying to improve on. And then run the experiment, track the hell out of everything that's happening in that test, and then say, this is what happened. We now have a new hypothesis backed in now the previous data and more research. So now we want to test this new hypothesis. And oh, by the way, it's a lot less dev work because we already built it out this way. You run the test, you learn, you and you win quickly. As best as you could do that, I think that's the best way to shift the mindset away from a toxic like win-win-win into learning to win and just stick to that process as best as you can. If all you're trying to do is win as quickly as you can, I think you'll either not necessarily hit the winners that you'd like Mm -hmm. or you might be more incentivized to um, call winners that aren't truly winners. I'm going to go uh, mention correlation versus causation and go back to that a little bit in the next statement I'm about to make is that do you think the view of testing to learn sits differently where companies are using a free tool versus those are using paid solutions? Oh, that's a great question. I love that. So I think that generally speaking, the free tools do have limitations And I think some of them can be actual physical limitations within running the tool as well, such as uh, you can only have five live experiments at one time, which is a pretty major limitation Mm -hmm. on a free tool. Um, Or other things like the amount of metrics you could track, et cetera. So it could inherently limit the growth of your program if you're on a free tool. So that could be problematic. So so let me me just pick you up on that. So if I'm hearing you right, it's saying when there are limited amount of tests that you can do because of the restrictions of your free tool, you're more likely to go to those that are going to win rather than those that you're going to learn from. Would that be too far a leap to jump? It depends. I I think this is another correlation versus causation thing. Um, I, I don't necessarily believe that there are always bad programs on free tools and there are always like great programs on more expensive tools. But I think generally speaking, the correlation is that if you're on a free tool, it's probably, again, correlation, but it's probably that you, ha- you don't have a dedicated resource or resources to experimentation. It's like a marketing person's like fifth job is experimentation and they don't quite understand it as well. So they're running button colors, they're using WYSIWYG, they're trying to do their best, yeah. but they just don't have the understanding, education or time or resources to run high quality tests and conduct all the research to support it. Versus if you have the budget to spend on, let's say, Optimizely, which Last time I checked it, it was in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Then correlationally, you probably have, if not a dedicated resource, more than one dedicated resources to experimentation, which along the maturity side, if you have people and the skills, as well as a tool that supports the people and skills, you'll be in a really great spot. 
uh, I'll go back to my, uh, my dumb analogies. You can have, I don't know, like a 1987 Toyota Corolla, and you can have a 2006 Mustang with 5,000 horsepower, um, as you could tell, I'm a car guy. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not. I don't know anything about cars. <laughs> but that Toyota Corolla will get you from point A to point B. That Mustang will get you from point A to point B. Um, perhaps that Toyota Corolla might take a little bit more time. Maybe it's a little, you know, maybe the MPGs in that car is not great. Maybe it's rattling a little bit, but it'll get you there. But if you put a child in a Mustang, that doesn't mean that person's going to get from point A to point B. They might not even be able to start the car. Good analogy. So, all right. Thank you for the words of affirmation. There. I like that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so one of the reasons I, I brought that up is that Google Optimize, the free version, in fact, Google Optimize is sunsetting its product. And therefore, there is this kind of, I could call it churn in the kind of the business of those people are saying, do I mm -hmm. stop doing experimentation because I now have to pay for it? Do I then have to find a justification of how I can pay for it? And it's all at different different levels in there. But we've also got this other dichotomy that's, that's happening at the same time, which is this program called Chat GPT. <laughs> and I think that we're in this potential perfect storm where companies, and I'm not going to mention any names, but companies may be thinking that actually I could pay for my, my testing tool, but actually if I use chat GPT, all my content can be done in half the time or even a quarter of the time. Do you think that companies are thinking that way? I mean, what, what's your thoughts on chat GPT, first of all? <sighs> That's a great question. And this is something I've genuinely been thinking about more and more because I think chat GPT and its impacts are being wildly overstated because people are just excited by its potential. It's a very interesting tool and I'm not trying to demean the impact and the coolness of it. I've asked it questions. It's very cool. It's very powerful. I did ask it a question about who are the top CRO experts and I didn't show up. So maybe there was a bug in the tool. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what was going on with that. But I think if people treat chat GPT as, uh, here's another example, uh, as like a TI-83 in calculators in like high school, if you treat it as a supplementation I think it's incredibly powerful and what you'll be able to do with the testing program with the augmentation of AI is, is going to be just powerful stuff where I think it's hard to ignore the economy and just general business decisions being happening with layoffs and, you know, businesses hoping to get more out of people with less um, actual people and resources I do fear that chat GPT will be perceived as a replacement to good processes, good people, good skills, rather than an augmentation in the same way that like I see tools like Google analytics and heat maps and session recordings and user testing. And, you know, all these are augmentations to experimentation, but they don't replace experimentation, nor should they, they should all work cohesively together to build a badass experimentation program that then supports these other user research, user, you know, all, everything that's core to the user and data and building a good CX. I just, I, I fear that people are going to get so jazzed about chat GPT that they'll genuinely think we could just replace, you know, an experimentation strategist with just, you know, sacrificing three goats to the <laughs> chat GPT gods and then giving them a strategy around experimentation. Because where chat GPT, I think, fails in the same way that I think best practices fail is a lack of understanding of the business and a lack of understanding of the genuine research and all of the other inputs that make customers unique and your product unique or your service unique. So I, my hope is that ultimately it will just be something that it's just an augmentation and it helps people support and take it to the next level. But if you, if you believe that chat GPT and other AI type tools are just going to outright remove the human parts of, you know, experimentation and user research as a whole, 
I I don't think you know maybe and maybe in a few years maybe that will dramatically change, but honestly, dude, in the current state, uh, I I went to a, a search engine and I asked, "Is avocado okay for dogs?" And the highlighted part of it said safe for dogs, but it forgot to highlight the is not part. <laughs> And I was like, oh, that's terrible. Like, that is a big miss for the tool to not do that. Yeah, I I don't know. At some point, we're all going to be run by Terminators, I'm sure. But I just don't think that's in in the next, like, four years or so. So the title of our podcast is about learning to test and getting towards the the end of it. There's there's a couple of things I'd like to point out. We're, We're talking about... People coming out of universities or colleges with very little understanding of experimentation, especially those in doing marketing degrees and things like that, which I think is one of the fixes. We need to be able to start early and get those people involved in it. But the next thing was actually linked to the chat GPT thing. They're saying, are people now willing to learn? And I'll I'll take an example and I'll read off here. This is off the BBC website here in the UK. It said um, Cardiff University said it was reviewing its policies and would issue new university wide guidance shortly because it was getting lots and lots of visits. In, in fact, it was 14,443 visits to chat GPT site on the university's own Wi-Fi network in the month of January, which was the time that they were doing their final exams. And one particular individual who, who said he was a, an average at 2-1 grade submitted two 2,000 essays in January, one with the help of ChatGPT and one without. And guess what? He got a first for his, for his ChatGPT essay. So is it that we've got people who now don't want to learn and now don't see the need for learning? And so education is going to become even more difficult to be able to get people to understand about experimentation. Big question, I know. That's kind of depressing. <laughs> <laughs> I like. Sorry to end on a high note. <laughs> no, it's interesting. I mean, that's it's kind of sad because, like, as you know, I love genuinely learning, and I love you know being challenged, challenge my norms, and challenge the stuff that I have. That I have hypotheses that might be proven wrong, and instead of being like, "Ah, crap, I was wrong," I'm like that's really cool. I didn't think about it that way, or I didn't know. So to hear that, like so many people are taking shortcuts that they can, that's totally their, their right to take the shortcuts as they need chat GPT, et cetera. Um, it's almost just taking the learning out of, uh, out of class. And instead of it's, it's funny. I think what ends up happening a lot of times in school, which is why as a personal opinion, I genuinely did not like my experience at college because I felt a lot of times we were pressured for results and getting scores on exams without genuinely understanding the material. Um, Just like Sarah? Full circle, baby. Um, <laughs> so I would be lying if I didn't study for classes to pass the class rather than to actually learn the material to be able to pass the class, which is yep. a problem. And I think in the same way, so many people, they, they care less about the actual process of learning and understanding what's happening, and they just care more about results. And I have no historical data to say, is this a trend that's increasing or decreasing? But I do think the availability of AI makes it easier to just defer to the shortcuts and just defer to I don't necessarily need to learn I'll just I have the results I'll just plug it into a a calculator and do it and I don't have to do any work and I could go back to you know playing video games or something Um, so I think if we're able to understand and like move towards maybe this is just a more societal thing that I hope we ultimately move toward I'm not trying to get really like big brain, like get on a soapbox about how society's kind of in trouble here. But I do hope that there's a turning point around um, AI being so oversaturated that people will be more inclined to look for authenticity. You know, I think that's something that I pride myself on that 
I am genuinely myself. I'm not fake about the, you know, the results, the personality. If you want to talk to me now in a podcast, or if you want to slack me, or you want to talk to me on LinkedIn, I'm, it's, I'm the same person everywhere. My friends can attest to that. I think people are going to look for more authenticity as we get oversaturated in a world where literally everything is artificial. In the same way, I believe that there will be a correction back towards actually learning in uh, in like university. And even now, like people are so oversaturated. People have like hundreds of thousands of dollars in college debt. And what did they learn how to like, what did they learn in college? Truthfully, I've learned so much more in one year on the job than I did in four years in college. To be fair, I was pre-med. I wasn't digital marketing. But still, just as a general learning, I learned so much more being in a job with real world experience talking to people than I did reading a textbook that was, you know, seven years old and was teaching just stuff about, you know, stuff that's old. My hope is that we pivot towards people actually taking classes because they want to learn. And as a result, we actually increase that knowledge. And I think experimentation will be part of that. I know I'm kind of like rambling here, but (laughs) I do, I do genuinely believe that we're going to move back towards classes being learning based and people are going to want to learn about experimentation in the way they're going to want to learn about all of these things. And it's, it's the same way that GL being taken out of the market is going to, you know, weed out people who are just using optimize as a CMS. I think Mm -hmm. college is going to be so expensive and college is going to be at a place that place that you're surrounded by people who are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars because they want to learn, Uh, or you're going to be part of smaller classes that, you know, there's LinkedIn courses. One of my one of my good friends just released a course and he built on his own. People are creating these courses on their own that are cheaper, but you're taking these classes and spending money out of your pocket to just genuinely learn. I, I hope that experimentation is part of marketing degrees because I think it's important. But I hope that at a, taking a step back, people are just more interested about learning as a whole. And it will, it, my job, or at least my LinkedIn posts will be less learning and more celebrating that people are all in this together. And maybe that's the happy, you know, I'll end on versus the, <laughs> we're all going to be taken over by robots in Terminator is, uh, is going to happen sooner than we think. So Shifa, don't stop doing what you're doing on LinkedIn and, you know, your videos and things like that, because it is very, very educational and it is whimsical as well. It does allow people to have bite sized education, which I think is where a lot of people are today. Um, But it's been a great conversation. I, I know we've taken probably the best part of three quarters of an hour in this, but it's been very exciting. And your passion continues to come through about your excitement about um, CRO and experimentation. I think the next six months, a year, it's going to be really interesting. The economic climate, Google Optimize moving away, chat GPT or GPT-4 coming out. It's going to be one of those years where we look back and say, gosh, we went through a hugely turbulent time. So, Shiva, for now, thank you very much for your time. And it's been great. And I hope you've enjoyed it, too. Thank you so much for having me. This is fun. I'm I'm like expanding my horizons and digging into parts of my brain I didn't even know existed. <laughs> well, it's been good. So thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it.